OK, well, let me turn it off for now and uh, shall we go on? Brilliant. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're here today with Joe Hart, who's going to be presenting fire safety in sports stadia. Um, are you still with me, Joe? Yes, I am. I just turn the camera off for a sec. Brilliant. OK, if I could ask anyone to put any um, questions in the chat and at the end, I'll facilitate them questions best I can. We are going to record the presentation today, so it will be available to watch back on the IFE Southern Branches website. Um, just to remind everybody that any opinions in the presentation are that of the presenter and not of the IFE. Um, if I could ask you, as I said, put the questions in the chat, please don't put any hands up because we struggle to get around to everybody that way. Um, and I'll pass over to you, Joe. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Dana. Um, let me share a screen and we'll get set up. And I'm going to turn my camera off just for the bandwidth because there's quite a few of us. If everyone else can do the same, just make sure cameras and microphones are off. Um, hopefully we'll go OK with bandwidth. So, Dana, could you just confirm you can see my screen there? It should just be yes. the front page. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Lovely, thank you. Then I will uh, crack on. So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the latest IFE Southern Branch webinar. Uh, this one is being delivered by myself, Joe Hart. I'll tell you about uh, who I am in the next slide. This month, we're looking at fire safety in Sports Stadia, which was, I think, a request from one of our members again. It might not have been. We've been planning this one for a little while, so we'll. Uh, I can't remember the the origins of this one, but hopefully, of interest to, to lots of you anyway. Um, with this is part of a regular webinar series. The first Wednesday of every month, we as a branch organise a CPD. I do one in every three of them. So this is my second or third one of the year now, I can't remember. Um, usually about an element of fire strategy, fire engineering or fire safety. And in between, we have other members uh, come and give presentations. If anyone wants to give a presentation, drop the committee a line um, and we can arrange that in between my ones as well. So who I am, first of all, Again, as ever, I've been watching all the names come in. Lots of us do do know each other. Uh, but for anyone that doesn't, my name's Joe Hart. I'm the group director of the Delta Group of Companies. So I'm head of fire engineering at Delta Fire Engineering. I'm also director of Delta Fire Safety, which is a fire consultancy firm doing risk assessments, compartmentation surveys, and some other things coming up that we are very excited to launch in the next couple of weeks. And Delta Fire Testing, so our testing lab up here in the north of England, we're just building and kitting out at the moment, and I'm I'm head of fire testing there as well. Um, when I'm not doing that, I'm also spend some time at the University of Central Lancashire, where I know lots of you guys from. I'm a lecturer in fire engineering there. I teach lots of modules related to design of fire strategy, uh, fire engineering, and performance-based design is what I specialise in. The lecture tonight is part of my rewrite for next year's programme. So anyone who's dialed in who is going into their final year undergrad, this is a bit of a head start for you. So you're going to learn about this next year in one of my modules. So this is kind of level six level content, final year degree, but nothing too technical for us tonight. Really just a bit of an introduction. So content wise, I should also say this is part of a much larger lecture that lasts for four hours. I've stripped it down to give some of the, the salient points. The aim of the session, first of all, is just to introduce some of the concepts behind both design and management of fire safety in sports stadia. So quite a niche area um, of fire strategy and fire safety work. It's an area that we as Delta uh, specialise in. It's one of my personal specialisms as an engineer. We've worked on quite a few over the last year or so. Um, we're working on a couple at the moment as well. So lots of work in sports stadia. Very specialist, very challenging at times. And I'll talk about complexities, but also really interesting work. Content wise, I'm going to talk about types of sports stadia just to kick us off, get us in the mood for it. A little bit about the legislation we've got uh, that is specific to sports stadia. Introduce the green guide. So the green guide being a, a code of practice for design of sports stadia and also management. I'm going to run through a little calculation we might do to work out the occupancy. It's not in huge amount of depth. Those of you who are going into your final year undergrad. Take some notes and read up on that before September. Um, and then I'm going to go through some features of fire safety in sports stadia and then the types of report we might produce as well. So. Starting with legislation as ever, most of you guys certainly have sat through a presentation with me will know that I spend a lot of time looking at legislation, um, not in this evening's webinar, though, nice and straightforward. Broadly speaking, we have the same regulatory regime as we'd have for any building when we're looking at sports stadia. So the one on screen there looks like Everton to me, doesn't it? Um, 
subject to the building regulations. So as we would do for any type of building, we're assessing against the requirements of the building regulations for a new build design. Once a stadium is occupied, it is occupied by members of the public and it comes under the remit of the regulatory reform fire safety order. So we need to do risk assessments, we need to manage fire safety, all those things we do for any type of building. If we're constructing an office or a resi tower, a school building, whatever it might be, it's the <laughs> same regime. The only exception we have is a couple of, bless you, whoever was unmuted and sneezed just then, by the way. Um, we have a couple of additional pieces of legislation that apply specifically to sports stadia. So these are really key ones to know about if we're working in this sort of field. The first one of these is the Safety of Sports Grounds Act 1975. Without delving into the intricacies of it, the main thing it does is it imposes a requirement for what's called a safety certificate for sports stadia. So much like we used to have fire certificates before 2005 under the Fire Precautions Act, still in place now for sports stadia. Requirements there where we've got a stadium with a capacity of more than 10,000 or more, there has to be the local authority signs off a safety certificate. And a big part of that safety certificate is uh, means of movement around the stadium and also fire safety as well. So there's a, there's a component there for fire safety as a legal requirement. That 10,000 is worth noting is there is a requirement for Premier League football or top tier football where it drops to 5,000, I think it is. So there are certain parameters you might have to meet for the Safety Sports Ground Act. And the second one is the Fire Safety in Places of Sports Act 1987. Now, anyone who's been taught law by me before, which is a couple of you guys I saw coming in, um, will know my rule. Take a major piece of legislation and go back 18 months and find the fire. 1985, really significant fire um, at Bradford Football Club. We fast forward 18 months from then, we get a new piece of legislation. What the Safety in Places of Sport Act tells us is that we have to have safety certificates again wherever we have 500 people or more in a single stand. So this safety certificate concept comes in in a couple of different legal frameworks and a really key part of those is how do people get in and out the stadium, both in emergency and non-emergency conditions. So lots of fire elements come into the running of sports stadia and the design under the building regs. Talking about sports stadia, what probably springs to mind, it does for me as a football ground, but that's not the case at all. It can be anywhere where we have um, sports being played and there are lots of different types of sports stadia. Unlike if we define the parameters of an office building, we can broadly look at occupant condition, types of construction, uh, the likely activities that are going on there. Much harder for a sports stadium to do that. Top right, we've got the London Stadium, now West Ham's ground. We can see that that's enclosed on the upper tiers but has an open roof deck it's a continuous stadium so that means you've got continuous stands all the way around in theory you could stand at one side of the stadium and do a full perimeter without going down to pitch side it's used not just for football i was at the athletics there a couple of years ago watching it and they had an athletics track around the outside the london stadium after the olympics of course was used for lots of different and during the olympics lots of different events and compare that to the bottom right, the home of the mighty Harrogate town, Weatherby Road Stadium. So we've got non-continuous stands in this case. When I used to go there as a kid, only one of those stands existed. I actually think they've got a new stand not on that photo now. It's been built up over a period of time. They're different non-continuous stands. However, it is used only for football because it's a relatively small club, but the pitch is designed only for football, whether it's five, six or 11 aside. Whereas West Ham's ground is used for gigs, music gigs, uh, the NFL plays there, I think, all sorts of different things going on. So when we look at a sports stadium, it's slightly more difficult for us to define exactly what might be going on in there. We have to think a little bit wider than just a standard definition for a sports ground. And picking up on that idea of events, we say that an event is anything that happens at a sports ground. It's not even the playing of sport. It could be entertainment. I'm going to Wembley this weekend to watch a gig and I was at Wembley for the FA Cup final a few weeks ago. So within the exact same venue, within a very similar part of the stadium, we'll be seeing just a few weeks apart a big football match with 90,000 spectators and then a music gig in the same area. So all meets the definition of an event that we have to design and manage for. So the complexities involved, this is just a really high level list as to why it's so complex to design fire safety and manage fire safety in sports stadia? Well, first of all, we obviously have a high population density, tens of thousands of people in a building for a short period of time. Mass crowd attendance is a term we use quite a lot when we're talking about this. We have people moving en masse around a stadium. Let's take a football match as an example. 
people will move in the first hour before the game happens. 90,000 people might move to their seats. At half time, 50, 60 percent of those might move around and go back again. And at the end of the match, we've got 90,000 people leaving all at the same time. So mass crowd movements is a huge issue for us in fire safety, not even for an emergency condition, just that number of people moving as a result of the event that's going on. Often have complex building layouts, not always the case. They can be designed architecturally to be quite straightforward. But in many cases we have in a sports stadium, we have what we call the bowl, the area where you would sit and you would watch an event occurring. And then you have to re-enter the stands to find a means of escape to leave the building. We don't tend to design so people go out onto the pitch as a means of escape, for example. In fact, other areas of design for fire, uh, for sports stadia forbids that. It's designed intentionally so that you can't go onto the pitch. So complex building layouts, very, very long travel distances. We don't tend to design and define travel distances for sports stadia. I'll go on and talk a little bit about that. And they're just the parameters relate to the building itself. We think about the occupants as well. So the profile of spectators, their loyalties, their age, their gender, patterns of behaviour. If you think again, I'll stick with football just because it's a bit fresh in my mind at the minute that again, the FA Cup final, half the stadium was wearing blue, half the stadium was wearing red. By the end of it, everyone wearing red was very, very angry and everyone wearing blue was very, very happy. Changes in the profile of those spectators. If you have um, a football stadium that has a home and away end, everyone in that away stadium, side of the stadium is probably unfamiliar with the surroundings whereas everyone in the home end is probably more likely to be familiar but not necessarily familiar people that go to sport events are not necessarily people that are familiar with the building so another complexity for us to consider arrival and departures how and when they use stadium facilities again that mass transit of people leaving at full time half time we've got different occupant distributions within the stadium big complexity for us for fire safety and to fit again occupants who are unfamiliar as well as alcohol being served i was googling this morning to try and find a picture um and i was googling drunk people in stadia and you get lots of very funny pictures i thought i could use but then i thought to myself well i was drunk in a stadium last week that's a photograph i took of dodgers stadium in los angeles where i was you can't drink in the stands in the uk but you can in america i took full advantage of that and there's a picture of me me holding a beer at these events there is a kind of there is, um, from an event management perspective, there are concessions and people selling beers and all those kind of things. So we consider in the occupant profile, people may be in a different pattern of behavior. And also we've got the involvement of drink there as well. So we've got all the things we would normally do in terms of wayfinding and the uh, condition of people that are involved in fire safety. So the way we go about doing it is with the what we call the green guide. This is an opportunity for us to use a specific piece of prescriptive guidance. So unlike approved document B, we might pick up and that's used for lots of different building types. We also have opportunity to design for a specific type of premises. And in this case, we have published by the Sports Ground Safety Authority, the SGSA, um, the guide to safety at sports grounds. So lots of very specific advice related to how to design sports grounds. We call it the green guide because it's green, of course, and it's a very, very good piece of guidance. I actually I've said this before, I think on one of these webinars, but I've certainly said to people anecdotally that of all the different pieces of guidance we use for fire safety, this is probably number one for me in terms of the way it's written, the way it's applied, the specificity of it to the building you're designing. I do think it's one of the best and I particularly like the methodology for means of escape that I'm going to talk about in a couple of slides time. So very, very good piece of guidance. Currently on its sixth edition. Uh, published in 2018. It was revised for the sixth edition as a result of a number of security alerts in stadia across the world, the Paris attacks and the Manchester Arena bombings being two of the, the primary ones. There were a number of changes between the fifth and sixth editions as a result of that. One is an enhanced section about security. Security is a big design feature for, for sports stadia, as you would imagine, and also evolving technology. So using CCTV and the management of mass crowd events, whether that be for a fire evacuation, whether it be for a security alert, Lots of things put in there in terms of uh, emerging technology. Another feature of the Green Guide, if you go out and buy a copy, it's about 100 quid, I think, uh, whether it's online or digital. Uh, but they also have some online sections, which I think is really good. So they have a series of annexes and worked examples on the website. Now they're free and it means if you buy the guide, but there's an update, you don't have to go out and buy it like approved document B every time. They update the online versions and you can go and get these for free. So what they cover are a couple of the technical elements that we'll touch on tonight, but not too much, what's called the P factor and the S factor. Um, 
couple of annexes, D and E about checklists that you would use specifically for events, so to do medical rooms and what's called demountable structures, and some worked examples for the means of escape related to football and rugby, cricket and race course. Now, just looking at those, you can see a football and rugby ground are very similar broadly. Pitches are about the same size. Everyone's looking at a single point. But a cricket pitch is very different, as is a race course, much larger space with smaller stands. So you can see how they group those worked examples into types of building. As I say, they're free to download. You can take, go away and take a look at those. The one in bold is one I would encourage everyone to go away and have a read of. And I hope the SGSA email me later and say they had a peak of traffic in this one, because I tell people to read this one all the time. An annex specific for colour vision deficiency. It's a pertinent issue in sports stadia, but I actually think that that should be in every fire strategy and every guidance, including approved document B9999. Go and have a read of it. It's very good. One in 12 men are colourblind. One in every 200 women are colourblind. It affects men more commonly than women, um, including me. So I'm colourblind as well. So I have a real research focus on this. So I'm really interested in this area. Go off and have a read of that. It's quite interesting related to colours of fire exit signage. Uh, we use high vis vests quite often in sports stadia, green for a fire marshal, yellow for health and safety, but actually one in 12 men and one in 200 women can't tell the difference. So a really interesting element you can read there for free as well. So go and take a look at that. So to briefly go through the way that we work out um, safe capacity, one of the big drivers for fire safety in a sports stadium is how do we evacuate it? We've already said it's a high population density in a relatively complex building very often. And there has to be different methodologies for doing this. The safe capacity of the building isn't only driven by fire. We've got design for security, design for crush, um, all sorts of congestion factors and things like that. Fire safety is just a component of it, but often is one of the limiting factors. So section two of the Green Guide, when you pick it up, it says that uh, it provides a methodology for determining how many people can safely be within the stadium or conversely, how many exits do we need for the number of occupants that we want? And it relies on calculating four different things and working out which of those four is the lowest and you adopt that as the design principle. So it's very, very different to the way we design in a typical building environment where we would, let's say for an office, we would measure the floor area, divide by a floor space factor to get our occupants and we'd size our exits based on how much width there should be and travel distance to those exits. Very, very different in sports stadia. And as I say, I'm not going through a full worked example here. You can get the free worked examples from the SGSA website, but it raises a really interesting area that I use beyond sports stadia in all of my fire strategy work, which I'll, uh, I'll drip feed in as we talk about it. So the first one of these is to calculate how many seats there are in the stadium. This is the first thing that has to be done. And that's not simply go around and count the seats and say that's the number. It's not necessarily 50,000 if it's a 50,000 seat stadium. As part of sports stadium management, there is a requirement to regularly check whether seats are usable. So any seat that is damaged or inadequate, somebody's tried to tear it up because their team lost, or the hinge has been damaged, we call those tip ups. So generally we have the tip up seats uh, on a hinge, they can break. Records have to be maintained of how many seats are physically usable, and this has to be constantly managed throughout the life cycle of the sports stadium. Also, any that have restricted views, the one on the, pho the photograph on the right is a real photo. Quite often in old grounds, we find things like this where they've added gantry levels as a result of changing legislation. Um, that looks like it might be a sort of CCTV or this often happens where we've got media gantries that go in to allow filming of uh, or live streaming via the, the media of uh, sport events that restricts seating. So that reduces the capacity. You can't rightly sell this ticket and say that it's the same price as anywhere else in the ground. So to calculate the number of seats, it's not simply a case of just count them. You do have to go to the uh, ground and do it, and it has to be constantly managed. You may have a reduction in number of seats you can sell week on week, just as a result of the state of the uh, ground because of the management of it, because of the way that they are being maintained. So that's the first thing that we would do. We'd look at the number of seats that are available and start to understand how many people might be in that position, uh, in that stadium. But the PNS factors that we talked about on a previous slide, it's one of the specific annexes, annexes A and B for P and S respectively, is another factor we add in about how many people we're going to have. And this is the thing that I'm not going to go through in too much detail, but just to highlight that just because there are X number of seats in the stadium doesn't mean we design for that number of people. The P factor is related to the physical condition of um, the capacity of the or the condition of the seats. 
and the S factor is to do with safety. And what we do as designer or risk assessor or competent person looking after a stadium is we assign a factor for both P and for S. And it's a number between zero and one. And what we do is we say that if everything's absolutely golden, everything's rosy, we say it's a one factor. Because what you then go on and do is you multiply the number of seats by that factor. So if you say that everything's fine in terms of the physical condition of the ground, we've been around done an inspection and safety wise, we have sufficient stewards, we're ticketing directly to seats, we're not selling tickets on the outside. That's a one as well. You would take your capacity of seats like 4,000, for example, and divide by one and you would say 4,000 is the occupancy. But something that comes up very often in fire risk assessments, I find for these is an issue related to safety or the physical condition of the st of the stands. And what we ha then have the ability to do is to use this methodology and say we're going to reduce the S or um, or P factor down to less than one, somewhere between zero and one, for example, 0 0.5. And that's a quantifiable way of limiting the occupancy based on fire safety. We can say that the example on screen as a result of there being a limited number of stewards at the game this weekend, we're going to uh, apply an S factor of 0.5, which means that we can only have 2000 spectators. Similarly, if we've been round and we say that the condition of the back of house areas is not effective, it looks like there's lots of blocked exits and things like that, we might reduce down the uh, physical, the P factor to 0.5 and say, again, we're only going to have 2000 people in there. So there is a methodology in terms of both design and then management of reducing occupancy as a result of what we found in terms of fire safety. And that's the first way that we might go about looking at exit capacity in a stadium. The second one I think is, is is really interesting and it's one when I work on sports stadia I think is often the most prevalent. It's to do with how people enter the ground rather than exit the ground. Typically an hour before the event starts the turnstiles or the gates will open and people can start to enter the ground and there is a factor about how quickly people can enter the ground and if in that hour you can only get a certain number of people through the gates that's the capacity of the stadium. They don't continue filling once the game starts once the event begins they cap it at that point. And there is a factor in there of uh, 660 persons per entry point per hour. You can see how we might use this as a designer the other way around. How many entry and exit points do we need to the stadium? Well, if we're looking to get 10,000 people in there, we can use that 660 factor to work it out. And one thing this often involves doing is going down to site to watch an event, to see what the flow rates are of people entering and exiting the stadium. Because on the top right there, we can see a traditional turnstile may be slightly slower than a more modern speed gate. So these decisions are things that impact uh, the design as we go forward. And of course, then have a huge impact on fire safety because a turnstile at the top there would be very difficult for us to justify as a fire exit, whereas a speed gate at the bottom interface with the fire alarm system a bit easier. We could say, well, that is a suitable means of escape if we design it in a certain way. So a part of the fire strategy design for a stadium is Conversely, something that feels a bit odd is calculating how quickly people can get into the stadium in a non-fire event because that impacts our overall occupancy numbers. The third of these methods is working out escape routes based on flow rates of how to how many exits we need to get people out of the building. And this is the part that I said I'd rather like in the green guide and in sports stadia generally. We don't limit based on the widths of exits. We don't say five mil per person that gives us our capacity of that exit, nor do we say um, travel distance is limited to 45 metres. We design it based on flow rates and time to evacuate the area we're trying to evacuate. We break this down into low, medium and high risk premises. A low, medium premises should be evacuated within eight minutes, medium within six and high risk within two and a half minutes. We're familiar with two and a half minutes in, uh, in fire safety, of course. And we design based on flow rates and how quickly people need to get out. So again, if we're looking at how many exits do we need from a stadium, the answer invariably is loads. But how do we work out how many and how wide they need to be? We do it based off pedestrian flow rates, and it's a really effective way of doing it and calculating how long it will actually take for people to evacuate a building. We have flow rates given in the green guide. They're on screen there, 66 persons per metre per minute uh, for stepped surfaces and 82 persons per metre per minute for a level surface. And I was on site the other day at a stadium up in the north of England. That's a photograph I took. You can see that generally we have a mix of both step surfaces and level surfaces. So we have to consider congestion because we can see from those flow rates, people travel slower on step surfaces than they do on flat. So people will travel a lot quicker to this point where I'm stood in the photograph, but slower down the stairs. So there's a bit more engineering involved, a bit more consideration for the way that a building would really evacuate 
not prescribed widths and travel distances and things like that. Of course, we know anyone who's been taught by me or in my webinars will know that all of those widths and travel distances are actually related to time anyway. We've just adopted a, a best fit, really. For stadium, we tend to stick with the truer sense, which is how long will it actually take us to evacuate and what provisions do we need to evacuate within an acceptable number of minutes? And the final one is emergency egress and so not just evacuating the whole stadium, not getting everybody out, but realistically, what do we need to do in a fire? How long will it take us to evacuate a single stand, which is where we assume the fire is located? The photograph there is from a, a fire in Portugal or uh, I can't remember where it was actually, somewhere in Europe, I think. Um, and what that is, is a fire on the stands, which is one of the worst cases we could get. We have to then evacuate everybody inside. But what we don't necessarily need to do, bearing in mind this is an external fire, we don't necessarily have to evacuate the whole stadium. So the fourth means is by calculating emergency egress. Who needs to evacuate and when? How do we zone that? And we talk about zones in fire strategies for um, sports stadia. Zone one is the primary seating accommodation. Once somebody goes into uh, the vomitorium that I'll talk about on the next slide, they're then remote from that fire in a circulation route. Moving from there, we've got zones three and four places of safety and zone five completely remote from the effects of fire. So we can apply fire engineering again and some evacuation principles in who do we need to get to where to get them remote from the fire and how long should that take? So having used all of those four different methodologies, we then have lots of different answers. Each one of those will give you a different capacity for the stadium. And what we do is we look for the lowest. We say, what's the limiting factor there? It will often be fire, but it will sometimes be security. It will sometimes be in an existing uh, premises. It's, of course, the number of seats minus those that are not usable. But generally speaking, certainly if we're doing design of sports stadia, we'll be looking to maximise that and make sure we've got enough capacity, enough exits to get people evacuated. The stadium on the right hand side, it's a bit of a quiz now of who can name the sports stadium. This is the largest capacity stadium in the world. It's in Pyongyang. Pyongyang. Uh, I always forget the name of the stadium, I can't remember, but um, it's a 150,000 seat stadium. Now, if we were given that to design, we'd be looking for, we'd be posed the question, how many exits do we need? How wide do they need to be to evacuate 150,000 people? And what we would do is we would define in a period of minutes. So within eight minutes, how do we get everybody out of the bowl into a concourse where they're remote? And that's how we would look at and define the exits. And if you look around, I'll flick back. If you look around the top tier there, we've got all of these exits that go in called vomitories. And we'll come on and talk a bit about those, but they're the primary means of escape from most bowl type sports stadia like this one in Pyongyang. So fire safety in the Green Guide, that's our whole section in the Green Guide, just about means of escape and just about occupancy. We can see that fire safety will impact upon that, but it's not the only factor. It might be other elements to do with the design that impose exits and widths and things like that. There is, though, a specific section about fire safety in the Green Guide, and I'm going to whiz through some of the key considerations we have for fire safety when we're looking at both new and existing sports stadia. And it's one of the things that in sports stadia, uh, in the Green Guide rather, I particularly like that both new build and occupied stadia are covered in the guide. So we can apply these to both because, of course, a, a, a sports stadia that is built and already in occupation has a constant duty to manage fire safety because the type of event they're running will change very often. So vomitorium is a term I've used before. If you're not familiar with it, you can see uh, in any sports stadium, it tends to be the way you get from the bowl, from the seating accommodation into essentially a back of house space. Um, it's a passage beneath the spectator area where you would that you would use to access the spectator area or to leave in the event of an emergency or at the end of the event. They're accessed by vomitoria is the Latin word, but we tend to adopt the uh, anglicised version, I suppose, vomitories. So we have vomitories around the bowl that we go in to uh, evacuate. It comes from the Latin verb vomere, which means to spew forth, literally like to vomit as we have nowadays. Um, and you can see the picture there actually is a diagram of the Colosseum in Rome. So this is a, a really, really old method of design. You can see in this cross section actually that you tend to have more vomitoria as you go down because of the way the seats bank, which is a really useful feature for us because as you get more people descending the building, you also gain more space if you have banked seating. So that feature of a design stadium, of a stadium design rather, is really beneficial to us for fire safety because we gain capacity as we go further down the building. Unlike in a typical building, we don't widen the stairs as we go down. We just design up against congestion if possible. In this case, it's a feature that helps us quite a lot. So means of escape, we've said already, is one of our key considerations 
full evacuation of a stadium is very difficult to do and only if it's absolutely necessary do we design to do that. Um, an advantage again that we have is that stadiums themselves are designed to get people out very quickly because at the end of every event you've got thousands of people leaving to go to the car park. So we tap into the same design principles that an architect or designer would use and adopt it for fire safety. So there are some things to our advantage here. When we do means of escape, we're looking at pedestrian flow modelling usually. We often do advanced analysis. For example, some CFD modelling on the right hand side there. We might do some evacuation modelling. We may go down to site and watch the way, observe that people travel uh, around the stadium, how they use the exits and things like that. So means of escape is one of our key considerations that we have for sports stadia. In addition to that, though, we have other things we need to consider. Fire resistance as an example. So obviously a stadia is a big open space, but there are segregated sections as well. Some of you will be familiar with the picture on the right hand side. Some of you will be more familiar with it uh, on Saturday. But um, that is a, an, an area of Wembley Stadium that is offset from the um, stadium itself, from the bowl. This is the uh, hospitality section, essentially, that's separated from. So under the green guide requires fire resistance. There are sections that we have to design for compartmentation and fire resistant construction even beyond the actual seating area that we consider when we first look at stadia. What the Green Guide says is that any area adjacent to a seating accommodation or in a void should have a minimum of 30 minutes fire resistant construction. Now, of course, uh, a dynamic there is that usually hospitality suites like this one on the right hand side has glazing because that's an area where you can sit and watch the game. So huge requirement for fire rated glazing unless we can do some fire engineering and justify why we don't have fire resistance to that section. Also, structural fire resistance, as we'd have for any building, we've got structural elements within the stance. So they need a, a they have a requirement for fire rating, 60 minutes usually, but could be taller, uh, could be more if the building is taller. And we still have means of escape. So when somebody goes out into a vomitorium, that is a corridor. It's essentially a protected corridor as we'd have in any building. So requirements for fire doors, requirements for uh, protected corridors, self closers and all those kind of things. So we adopt some of our principles we'd be familiar with in any building and, and apply it to sports stadia. One hazard, again, this is a photograph I took a couple of weeks ago. I was on site um, at an existing stadium doing a bit of a survey is voids. Voids are really prevalent in sports stadia because, again, look, think back to that photograph. Well, it's not a photograph, is it? That diagram of the Colosseum in Rome, that section where everything's banked, you inherently get voids. And the photograph here, if you look at the blue hatch just above where I was stood, that's a void because the seating is above. So you get this void that varies, but it runs continuously across the whole stand. And what I was actually doing on site was the photograph on the left is some fire, uh, well, smoke detectors, actually, not heat detectors. And what we've got is a remote indicator below, because if we get fire in that void, which is used for storage, as most of these things are, we have a, a very, very high risk, very high hazard in terms of our fire risk assessment there on um, an area that is intrinsic to all fire uh, to all sports stadia. Really, really prevalent these voids, particularly that they're undivided and may be used for storage as well. So another consideration for us specific to stadia. Fire alarm and detection is another consideration for us. Now, this is different to how we'd have in a typical building. It's one of the reasons it's a bit specialised doing sports stadia and something for us to think about. We generally, in a sports stadia, we have two modes. We have both event day and non-event day. So during an event, it's a very different fire condition to not during an event. Stadia is still occupied. They're usually offices and hospitality and used for external events and all sorts of things when there's not a big game on. So we still have requirements for fire alarms. So during an event, we typically say we'll have a two stage alarm. We'll have a little investigation period in there. Bearing in mind the fire could be in an occupied, occupied or unoccupied part of the stadium. Um, and if we have to do a full evacuation, we have the advantage of using the public address system down in the bottom right hand side there. Um, we can see the huge speakers that are around. We can utilise those as part of our uh, fire alarm and detection cause and effect. So we do have opportunity to do that. During non normal operation, it's far less likely we've got a high proportion of staff available. It's less likely we can investigate uh, within six minutes is what we tend to adopt. So likely we have a different mode of fire alarm operation. And they are very, very complex fire alarm systems. Think about noise bleed in these. If you're only evacuating one uh, stand, how do you possibly alert only that one stand and not the others? If you go on a voice alarm and say only move from the north stand, but everybody else can see in the stadium that uh, the north stand's evacuating, very difficult condition to manage. 
unwanted occupation, uh, activation rather, and occupied, unoccupied. Manual call points don't tend to be in public areas because if Man United lose and the Man United fan wants to uh, delay City celebrating the FA Cup, there's a very easy way for them to do it. So they tend to be only in staffed areas. Emergency lighting very quickly is one that we look at. Again, lots of these events will go into uh, non-daylight hours. So we tend to have floodlights in stadia anyway. Again, another opportunity for us to use that borrowed light for something that's not a fire provision, but we can use as our uh, as part of our solution. One note in the green guide to be aware of is that the requirements for emergency lighting are much higher than in a typical building. It requires five looks um, anywhere and 10 looks above the viewing accommodation, which is a lot higher than our typical building. We'd use just one looks and escape routes. Some of the specific features we might have to try and design against or manage against. We often get pyrotechnics and flares at, um, at events like this. They are becoming increasingly prevalent. There's been a lot of high profile cases recently of flares being thrown onto pitches or even into the stands. And we've had people with burns and smoke inhalation as well. What we'll often find is we have fire service personnel at the event so that they can take a flare out with a fire extinguisher or they can pick it up with a grabber and take it to another area of, of the ground. In addition to that, we have to consider that we'll have intentional sanction displays. Bottom right, again, that's Dodgers Stadium. I was there last week and at the end of the uh, baseball game, they said everyone come down on the pitch. And I thought, that's a bit weird. Why are you doing that? Then they had a fireworks display. Uh, that's a photo that's still from a video that I took of it. I didn't go down to the pitch. Um, I stayed in the stands. But you can see that sometimes we also have these things. Same with gigs. We'll have pyrotechnics as part of a gig, which is in our building that we need to consider uh, fire safety for. Another one just to drop in, flags, banners and netting. Bottom right hand side is quite common where we're segregating fans. We'll have netting across seats so that they can't, um, so they're not in close proximity. Someone's thrown a bottle across it in the photograph very handily or even a flare. Um, that itself needs fire rating because that's a continuous strip of material right the way up the stand. And as the Villa fans have done up there in the top right, flags that are brought in, banners that are fixed to the stadium or brought in by fans, there is a requirement under the green guide or guidance suggesting that should all be treated, fire retardant materials or some certificate for it. Possibly easy enough for us to do in design and say that if we go out and buy a material, we're going to make sure it's fire rated. A bit more difficult if fans are coming in and we're asking for fire certificates at the turnstiles. So one to manage and think about large kind of fuel load that's being brought into the stadium as part of just uh, the running of the stadium. Another note about stewarding. Now, this brings me on to some of the final notes about the way that we actually go about managing and designing Stadia is that there is a really high reliance on management and stewarding is one way of doing that, but also having dedicated persons as part of the safety management system within the stadium. So there will be supervisory staff. There'll be a safety officer in all large stadia. There'll be a chief steward on match days or event days. We split this up generally, and this is a fire safety consideration because we think about static stewarding points. So all exits, crowd separation, pitch side will have stewards. They're the ones that facilitate an evacuation. So they're important elements of a fire strategy design. We then have mobile stewarding points. So typically the ratio that's used is one steward per every 250 spectators, but that's risk assessed up or down accordingly. Usually um, up, I suppose, in terms of more stewards. So usually use a ratio of one to 100 spectators for large events. Specialist stewards, we may have specialist fire stewards. I talked about uh, green high vis instead of yellow high vis. Persons who are only there for fire safety. Again, as part of our fire strategy or fire safety management, we may impose that. Use a specialist steward. They also have conflict resolution stewards as well, who as part of the game look for signs of a security issue that might be coming up. So Fire safety training is a really big part of the ongoing management because potentially we'd have tens of stewards who are responsible just for fire safety, if not even 100 stewards, just for fire safety during a very large event. So beyond design, there is this onus to look at management and running of events um, once the building becomes occupied. So to, those are some of the risks that we have and some of the hazards we design for and design against, hopefully, in many cases. But also reporting wise, what do we have? Well, this follows very similar to a typical building design. We would have for a new build because it goes for a building regs uh, uh, process. We would have a fire strategy for the stadium. So we would design all of the elements we've talked about. We would do a calculation for how many people can safely evacuate the building, how many people, how many exits we have, who facilitates that, what the alarm system is. We'd have a fire safety plan and that's the ongoing management. I talk about this in the next couple of slides. I won't do it too much now. 
that's because there's the onus on management we have to document that during design and say what's the ongoing plan for events and a fire risk assessment we've said that sports stadia come under the regulatory reform fire safety order so we would go and the green guide suggests that these are done annually to go and do risk assessments as well as event specific risk assessments where we think it's a higher occupant density or the uh Cognition of the occupants are going to change. If it's a big game, it might change the fire safety provisions. If we've got pyrotechnics and things like that. Uh, again, event specific FRAs might be needed. So of those three, a fire strategy, we cover the fairly standard things. Anyone in industry would be doing these, saying that we would cover emergency escape routes, fire alarm detection, fire rating. Looking at the one on the right hand side, I don't know what that is. It's come off of Google, but you'd be looking at once people come out into the vomitoria, where do they evacuate from there? How do they get to a final exit? What's the fire rating to the upper deck of the seating area? All that structure that's exposed, is that fire rated? Does that have a structural fire resistance applied? Fire service access to these uh, stadia, often very difficult to do because we've got large floor plans. And any fire engineering, quite a high proportion of fire engineering used on these schemes. Evacuation modelling, structural fire engineering, perhaps some smoke modelling, particularly if we have basements. A lot of um, stadia I've looked at recently uh, have car park, basement car parks with electric vehicles in and all sorts of risks we see elsewhere in the fire industry. Fire safety plan I've just been through a little bit. It's the ongoing management. What do we do? So who's responsible? What's the evacuation uh, procedures? Much like a fire safety manual we'd have in a building, we have to do that fire safety plan as well. Details of staff training. Again, big onus on staff management moving forward. And then our fire risk assessment. Again, this is a different stadium I've been to a few weeks ago. Pink foam, standard fire risk assessment principles that you would um, or issues you would pick up in any building. Uh, a photograph that I took, you get blocked exits and all those things. So that ongoing fire risk assessment, the only you know, intricacy with it is that you would have your annual assessment as required by the Green Guide, but also perhaps event specific uh, risk assessments where you're saying we have a particular risk being imposed by this weekend's event or next weekend's event. You'd hopefully do it more than just this weekend. Um, a bit more notice than that would be great, wouldn't it? But event specific fire risk assessments might be needed as well. So. Not bad for time, actually. OK, good um, to conclude and talk about what we've, we've covered in this one. Um, sports stadia themselves are a really unique and kind of specialist area of fire strategy work and fire safety. But a lot of the principles we'd use in any building type are what we adopt in um, in work in sports stadia. Broadly speaking, we use the same regulatory regime. So we would do a building regulations fire strategy if it's a new build. They come under the regulatory reform fire safety order for fire risk assessment. The only change there is we might have to do some event specific FRAs, which is um, dependent on what events are going on and how many occupants are expected. Of that fire strategy, one of the key drivers is means of escape because there's a really key onus on getting people out of the venue. But we have some advantages there as fire professionals, which is that contrary to a normal building, we're not the only ones designing to get people out of it. A big responsibility on the design team generally is how do we fill and empty this sports stadium during an event so there is a inherent advantage for us there over another building type we might be uh, we might be looking at essentially when i'm working on one of these jobs and i say can the exit be a bit wider if i'm designing an office the answer is usually no if it's a sports stadium it's yeah let's double it because actually it benefits other areas of the security strategy and the general pedestrian movement strategy as well there are just the two additional requirements, which are safety of place of sport and um, fire safety in place of the sport act as well about safety certification. So local authority need to come and do some work in these uh, sports stadia, sign off safety certificates in certain scenarios. And one key key thing is that there's a really high um, onus on management of these premises, whether that is during an event or between events, the fire strategy has to be continued through. And I've gone. 45 minutes without saying golden thread yet, which is a bit of a record for me, but that applies very heavily here, where principles we have in a fire strategy for a sports stadia have to be enacted and managed and have to be constantly reviewed during events and between events as well. Uh, so that's my conclusion. I'll do thank you for your attention. I've got a couple of bits just to say at the end and I'll come back to this slide, but um, if there are questions, I can answer those as well. I'm just going to quickly talk about two things at the end, Dana, if you'll let me. I'll see you've on. You've appeared on my camera, but let me just do these. First of all, um, we have a training course coming up with Delta. I'm not trying to sell things. I'm just highlighting this. You've seen it on the website and things anyway. We deliver all of our training courses at Wembley Stadium. That is just coincidence that I'm talking about Stadia today, but we do a lot uh, a lot of our work there, there at Wembley. 
introduction to fire strategy design. I've had loads of people email me about this, say, can we do more dates? Um, I'm delivering this in the summer between teaching fire engineering. I can't believe my luck I get to teach throughout the summer as well. So yes, there will be more dates, but they'll probably be around term time. So if you're interested in any fire strategy design, not specific to sports stadia, just fire strategy design generally, uh, we're running a bunch of courses through Delta Fire Safety now. So get in touch with myself or any of the rest of the team. Um, should we go course that? We do a CFD demo. Some of you will have seen my live CFD demos where I build a model and then have to ad lib the rest of it when it goes wrong. So they're always good fun for me to do. Talk about means of escape, fire service provisions, everything you do in a fire strategy. Really good little one week course there. And secondly, I'm going to talk about this one. So in the Southern Branch, we have our webinar series that this is a part of first Wednesday of every month, and we're introducing some new webinars as well. So you might have seen some marketing about this. Certainly, if you get our newsletter, you'll have seen it. But our fantastic early careers rep, Rhiannon Williams, who will be so embarrassed I've said her name on, on a webinar, sorry, Re, um, has organised some really fantastic webinars aimed specifically at early careers. So the first one's in a couple of weeks. I think it's two weeks today, actually, isn't it, guys? Um, they are going to be webinars much like this one, but focused more on people in early careers. So not technical elements, looking at some soft skills and also some things that might help you develop in your career, things like professional accreditations and registration. You can anyone can come along to them, but they are focused at people in their first couple of years. The first session is being delivered by Saskia Stimson Wright, and she's going to cover commercial awareness and some changes in industry at the moment. To be honest, wherever you are in your career, you're probably useful to go through evacuation lifts and building safety act anyway, isn't it? So SAS is going to do that one for us. The aim of the group generally is to give mentorship and training for people in their early careers. And it's all run by the IFE Southern branch by Rhiannon, who's our early careers rep. So that is the end. I just wanted to plug a couple of little bits at the end and come back to this. Um, my contact details are on there. One of the good things about doing these webinars is I meet loads of people after. So drop me an email if you're interested in what anything I've talked about and send questions through. And Dana, I'll hand back if there are any questions to do live. Otherwise, I'll await some emails later. Yes, please. Um, I don't know where to start. So as I said, that was recorded. There was a lot of really helpful information. So the recording should be available on our website in the next couple of weeks, if you do wish to watch it back. Um, cheeky question for me, Joe, in the training for strategy, was that useful for retrospective strategies as well or just original design? For the course that we're running? Yes. Uh, both, it covers both. Brilliant. All right. That's good to know. Um, and I do have some questions on the presentation. The first one is, do you see that there will be further revisions following the introduction of Martin's Law? There already is. There are lots of revisions going on, and I think the Green Guide is being reviewed itself now at the minute. So, yes, I'm actually aware of another piece of secondary legislation coming in under the Fire Safety Place of Sport Act at the minute as well. So there are lots of changes currently going on with Stadia. Um, yes. Brilliant. OK. Um, and I know you did mention fire statements. Are they used on a regular basis? Safety certificates? Uh, no, fire statements. Uh, so fire statement in terms of Gateway One or anything like that wouldn't apply here. This is non-domestic, but there used to be fire certificate requirements, uh, which are no longer required. But there is still that residual safety certificate that's required here. So as part of that, there is you have to document fire safety in a certain way, uh, which is usually some fire strategy elements in that component. So not a fire statement in terms of Gateway One or London Plan or anything like that for Stadia themselves. But um, yeah, a, a statement of fire conformity, it's often called, as though there weren't enough fire statement definitions already. Um, yes, usually as part of a safety certificate, there'll be a need to put in some uh, some fire safety information. Brilliant, thank you. And is the outside of the stadium for dispersal of fans considered in the strategy? Yeah, it's called, when we talked about zones, let me try and flip back and find it. We break down the means of escape into zones one to five. There at the bottom there. Outside of the stadium is called zone X. And what that is, is once people leave the building, there's a requirement to look how they disperse. So unlike in building regs for a normal building, we would say, sort of once they've left the building that's the responsibility of the design and once they're outside they can disperse that doesn't work when you've got 100,000 people so you have to look at zone x beyond what happens because of course if we spill out into the car park we're potentially obstructing more e egress and fire service coming in so there is a requirement under what we call zone x 
um, zone EX it's spelt, um, onto what happens when you leave. Yeah, it's a really key point of a strategy, actually. Good question. Brilliant, thank you. Um, if there are any more questions, please put them in now. The last one I've currently got is, would guidance from FIFA or other sports bodies need to be considered in the design of the stadium? Yes, absolutely. So whoever becomes responsible for the stadium may well have their own requirements as well. <laughs> Much like in a building, we would say, are there any client specific requirements? Often they come from insurers, for example. So in addition to what we've got in the green guide, we may have whoever's going to be occupying. And if you look at a stadium in the US, for example, there are really stringent requirements that go way above their minimum guidance and requirements to consider, usually to do with insurance and to do with other design elements outside of fire you have to consider. So where we would say you need a minimum uh, width of it's 750 mil for an exit here in the UK. There'll be requirements in terms of insurance and other egress that says no exit should be less than 1500. So definitely other things to consider. And often they do come from stadium operators like the FA. Brilliant, thank you. If I can just ask you to put back up the slide with your contact details um, and thank everyone obviously for coming and thank you, Joe, for the presentation. Uh, there we go. That's it. Perfect. So if you did want to take down Joe's details for any specific questions or to make contact with him, the details are there. The recording will be available and hopefully we will see you at the Early Careers event or our next webinar next month. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Dana, for hosting and uh, see you on the next one. Thank you very much.